You know what? The hair just went up on the back of my neck. Middle of the bush, Tennessee, Smoky Mountains, and all my instincts and, you know, Neanderthal man instincts are on high alert. And so I stopped. And then it hit. And I've never experienced this. I'd never experienced this before in my life. It was like it was right in the middle of my head, right inside my brain. The strongest ever uh, voice that was not my own. And just said, if you want to meet us, stay the night. And I just stood there gripped in fear. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me. And he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up. And that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix Legions, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, what are we chasing as a question tonight? And, you know, I've heard this sort of uh, encounter that you guys are going to hear tonight uh, off the air. I've probably heard it hundreds of times, if not thousands. Uh, most eyewitnesses don't want to come forward because it's they have a hard time articulating uh, what happened to them. And it seems even more crazy than seeing Bigfoot. So a lot of people won't come on the air uh, and my guest tonight is willing to come on and, and share what happened to her. And gosh, I met her probably four years ago at the International Bigfoot Conference. And when she told me what happened to her and her husband, uh, I remember her looking very shell-shocked. And I remember the really the first time I was taken back, it wasn't the first time I ever heard of something like this, but the first time I was really taken back, I was interviewing uh, Les Stroud, Survivor Man. Uh, let's take a listen. You know what? The hair just went up on the back of my neck. Let's just see what happens. So I'm like taunting the situation. Ah, I'll show you guys. Let's just see what happens. So I'm, you know, filming myself as Survivor Man does. And, and, uh, and we, I think we cut to commercial, come back, and, and we just moved on because eh, nothing much happened. It's not the truth. Um, because what happened, I wasn't ready to share. Not a chance. Uh, not that early in making the show. And, and why not? Because the gatekeepers wouldn't have been able to handle it. They would have said, no, Les, you can't. Whoa, whoa. Hey, whoa, TMI. No, no, no. Well, what happened was the hair went up on the back of my neck and I was gripped with this whole sort of thing. And again, I'm, you know, heck, I jogged 200 yards from where we're sitting right now 
and did not have that feeling and, and was stalked by a mountain lion the whole time. And we ended up butting, you know, we were 15 feet across from each other looking at each other. And, but I, I still, I just, I understand wildlife well yeah. that I don't usually get that fear factor. I'm like, okay, I'm 175 pounds cat. You better make this a good jump if you, cause you're not as big as me and I'm not a 12 year old. I'm not an eight year old kid and the cat and, I'm, and they, I just yell at the cat. He takes off. So that's all to explain the fact that with wildlife, I'm not instantly gripped with hair on the back of my neck, sort of instinctual stuff because I'm, I've trained so much with wildlife right. that I just know what to do. It's a different approach, but there I am stormy night, middle of the bush, Tennessee, Smoky Mountains. And all my instinct and, you know, Neanderthal man instincts are on high alert. And so I stop. And then it hit. And I've never experienced this. I'd never experienced this before in my life. This is, and I've heard other people describe this. It was like it was right in the middle of my head, right inside my brain. The strongest ever uh, voice that was not my own. And just said, if you want to meet us, stay the night. And I just stood there gripped in fear. I, I was like, uh, 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 I was like, I know, just like stammering. And then the second line was, and, and the funny thing is, before the second line was in my head, I felt this already. I felt like there was something standing right over there on that hill. So there's a gully and then a hill. And it felt, that's all I can tell you. Feelings aren't facts. Yeah, but I, I felt like it was a big prime of his life sort of male and a smaller young one and and the second voice said the second time it said you know we're over here on the hill but you have to stay and i literally this is survivor man talking now i literally in my head I, at some point i thought i, I got to answer and in, i just in my voice just thought i'm not ready for this i can't and it was literally okay and then turned and walked away. It turned and walked away. The feeling went away. The hairs went down on the back of my neck. It was gone. It was over. And it was so weird. I went and actually talked to a counselor, said, listen, what's schizophrenia? Because, you know, and of course, which yeah. she said, first of all, if you had schizophrenia, you wouldn't be asking me if you had schizophrenia. And so it was the weirdest thing ever. Now, I've experienced that about three other times. And as you can tell now, I take it kind of casually because to me, I thought, well, it's just telepathy. A lot of people talk about scientists study telepathy. Maybe, maybe that's an attribute because they don't have our larynx and our vocal cords and all that, although they make noises and all the rest. Maybe that's their language that, that maybe they're born with the, the, a strong, I mean, what if we were all born with the ability to, to, to use telepathic communication? We wouldn't be talking like this right now. We'd be thinking it. So no. maybe that's them. I don't know. I remember Les and I were doing the interview in his backyard, and he's got a beautiful place, and I almost fell out of my chair uh, when he said that. You know, because Les is very analytical. He's very uh, critical thinker, um, and I was shocked to hear that. You know, I think over time, after hearing it so much since that time, um, it doesn't shock me as much, but uh, it'd be kind of cool to get down to the bottom of it. So we'll see what we can do tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Diane to the show. Diane, thanks for coming on. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, sharing what happened to you. And I know this this really happened back in around 2000, uh, you know, over 22 years ago. And uh, if you would just kind of start from the beginning, I know you guys were in Utah, uh, you and your husband. If you would kind of tell us what you were doing and what happened. Well, my husband and I, we like to go um, up in the Uintas and, and we've done a lot of hiking, like hundreds of miles up there. And it was, um, I'm pretty sure it was around 2001, and, and it was like usually around September, we'd go to this area that we loved. It's near called Chapita Lake, and there's hundreds of small lakes all around there. We use a compass. We don't um, stay on the main trail too long. And so during the day, we would go on a lot of walks. And so I was with my husband on 
and we decided to uh, go on a, to a lake that was about six miles away. And so we had been hiking for probably three miles and I decided I had to stop and we came to a really nice small meadow and I just told him, why don't you go ahead and go? He had a border collie and I had a chihuahua. It was about an eight pound chihuahua. <laughs> and so I had her with me and I've always been so comfortable out in nature, in the woods. And I've always been really aware of smells of different animals and, you know, just been around a lot of big game. And so, you know, I felt pretty comfortable there because I know there's no bears up in the Uintas and the only thing are mountain lions. But so I was sitting in this meadow and he had gone on and it had been about an hour. And I like to do artwork and I have this, um, it's like beading thing and it's real colorful. And, and I was working on that when my dog all of a sudden tries to crawl under my leg and it was very unusual. Like, that's just not normal behavior for a dog. And she kind of whimpered. And then all of a sudden, there was this, a smell that was so intense and so putrid. And it was like all different kinds of smells stacked on one another. And I'm like, this just, I couldn't identify what it could be. Because I've been close to bears and moose and different game. So I knew something was really up. And I have to say, Bigfoot, I'd heard of it. I'd had an experience earlier in my life, but it was way back in the corner of my brain. I just didn't, I just wasn't going to go there, I guess. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking over and it's like a high overcast day. So it was like real even light. So you could see into the wood line somewhat. And as I noticed, the smell is getting stronger. First of all, there's no sound. And there's a huge black mass approaching and, and there's still no sound. And I'm like trying to figure out what it could be. And it comes just, I'd say to the edge of the wood line and stops and, and you couldn't even hear it shift. Usually you can hear something kind of, you know, if it's standing there shift. And I was staring at trying to make out what it is. And I could see through the, trees like the torso and it was really healthy black hair that looked like it's about four inches long and and uh, you can see part of the arms and a shoulder span that I had to say had to be at least four and a half feet across and I think once again in the corner of my mind I was like I didn't want to go there on what this was and I started looking down because I I just lost my nerve to really keep looking at what it was. At that point, I felt like I had turned, my insides had just turned into liquid. Like I call it liquid terror, like they were jello and I couldn't move. I was sitting on this little poncho thing that I'd made like a little blanket and I'm shaking and I decide, what else can I do? I'm out there all alone. I don't have any gun or any knife or nothing. And I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm way off of main trail. So I just decide I'm gonna just start beating again. And and so I start beating and I'm kinda shaking and I just keep doing it. And I it wouldn't and it just kept watching me. And it was like torture because it wouldn't go away. And I would like every so often look out the corner of my I had, I have long hair and I would look out sort of like the edge of my hair to see if something was still there. And you could see the mass, but I dare not look. I, I couldn't, like I said, I lost my nerve. I, I would have not been able to handle seeing more than what I saw. And, and I, I would say it was a good 10 minutes that went by. And during that time, I'm, it just wouldn't go. It wouldn't leave. I could feel it watching me. And it wasn't like being in the presence and I was sort of like analyzing this while I'm sitting there going, a moose doesn't do this. A bear doesn't do this. I, I just didn't know where to go with it. I even thought of a cow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. There's no cows up there. And, and, and it's like it was inside my head. And, it, and I could feel like I was being checked out. It's the best way to put it. And I just kept doing my beadwork. And after 
I, you know, it's hard to say. It felt like it was three hours, but um, I would guess it was probably about 10 minutes to 12, 12. The smell starts retreating, and I couldn't hear a thing, but I, by the smell getting fainter, I knew that it, that it had left, at least, and <laughs> I thought it had left. Well, so it, I don't know where it would be, but I thought it was gone. And I'm sitting there for another good two hours waiting for my husband to come back. And he shows up and I don't tell him anything of what happened because I felt like somehow I'd gone like into a departure from reality. And I just was glad that he was back and I felt like I was back in the world. That's the only way I can describe it. And so we get up and we hike back to our camp and and we make dinner and it's starting to get kind of, oh, you know, towards dusk. When um, all of a sudden there's all these, like, and they weren't yipping, but it was like howls. Uh, we're, we're thinking they're wolves. And we played, when we got home, we played um, sounds to compare. And it could have been coyotes up there. We've heard they're very aggressive. But there was like a circle around us, and it kept getting tighter and closer. And I said, we've got to build a fire because we did a lot of backpacking, and we didn't leave a trace all these years. We never built fires, but I knew we had to, you know, if those were wolves, we were building a fire. So, like I said, we were both unarmed, if nothing. And so we get this big fire going, and um, we had a pretty good stash of wood we gathered real fast. But my husband, um, I, I said, you might want to get some more wood. And he takes off, and it's dark now, and he comes back, and he's completely freaked out and says that he saw these two eyeballs that were a good eight inches apart that were the size of like, mm, gosh, two and a half, three inches across, two and a half, maybe something like that across. And it was yellow. And I just want to make a note that I just asked him today after all these years to tell me again about those eyes. And he described them identically to what he saw. So, you know, he's never forgotten that. And so we're, for some reason, the the coyotes, they, they were very close. He thinks he saw uh, some of their eyes, but all of a sudden it just stopped and it was really silent. But this other thing was out there crouched. And I never saw the eyes, but I sometimes wonder if I blocked that out. I don't know. I tend to disassociate if I'm really like that much terror but we just kept the fire going and we tried to sleep and the next morning we um pack our stuff up as soon as it was light and we had to hike about i'd say about three miles till you get to the main trail and there was something f and flanking us the whole time on our right and it sounded like three bipedal creatures whatever i still in my mind at that time did not go to the idea of Bigfoot. I just knew that it was something otherworldly was the best way I can describe it, how I felt at the time. And I also thought it was really odd. Our border collie, who was a real barker, oh God, they're known for that. He didn't make a sound. He didn't make a sound. I was thinking about that. And when we got to the main trail, it was like, once again, I felt like we came back to the real world or another world. And, um, Anyway, so we've never gone back to that area until uh, a year ago. I went back and checked it out, but I never. We, my husband stopped backpacking from that. So, yeah, Diane, can I ask you when you first saw the creature, or when you were looking at it, uh, was it standing up on two legs? Yes. Um, sorry, you know, I'm a little nervous, but so. It was like a wall of mass that approached. And I have, when I've gone over this and I, it's like I, like I mentioned, I was like, well, almost in denial of this ever happening. I've like relived it and I've um, looked at the height of our ceilings and it's, it had to have been at least nine feet tall and those shoulders a good four, four, four and a half feet. It was absolutely huge. And and I did get a really good look at the torso. I didn't see, it was more like the chest, I guess you'd say, and the shoulder, part of the shoulders. And that looked very healthy hair, like shiny and black. 
It's real black. Yeah, that's really terrifying. I mean, this thing's really sitting there watching you. Uh, how far away from you was this thing? Um, Not very far. This was a little tiny clearing in the middle of these woods. And I've, I've thought about that, too. And I would say it'd be about, oh gosh, 25 feet, maybe like that. Not far. It was like this little, I call them like these little fairy meadows. It was a really neat little spot. And and yeah, it was not very far. I wish now I would have looked to find to see the face. I still don't know what would have happened if I'd have seen it, though. But I couldn't. I lost my nerve. Yeah, I think everyone kind of loses their nerve. And, you know, everyone reacts different to fear. Sometimes I'll have people on the show and they will, they'll start laughing through their encounter. And, uh, people are like, why, why is this guy laughing? You know, it's kind of weird. He's, he's laughing while he's telling this terrifying encounter. And really what it is, is it's, uh, it's fear. It's a reaction to uh, being afraid. Uh, you'll hear people who are nervous and they'll laugh. And not everyone's going to react the same way. So, I mean, but everyone does tend to lose their nerve. Um, and in this, so this thing's right there looking at you. And you go back to, was it knitting? Is that what you were doing, Diane? I was doing, it's a, called a peyote stitch beadwork. And it's real colorful. And I have since learned that they love to watch people do artwork. And I, I didn't know what else to do. I was like, I'm out there in the middle of freaking nowhere. And there's no car I can go to. There's, I have nothing except for just me. And, you know, I just, I just thought the best thing to do was sit there. <laughs> That's all I knew what to do. And I thought, okay, I'll just start doing this and pretend that everything's okay. When I was a kid, I was in Yosemite and I came across a, a, one of the brown bears there. They're huge. And my sister and I, we just pretended like everything was cool. And we walked past it, and he was up on his hind legs, too. But I don't know. It was just, I thought, don't act afraid if you can, you know? Yeah, and I understand where you're coming from, Diane. I mean, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You're waiting on your husband. I mean, what are you going to do, really? Where are you going to run to? Um, so, you know, I kind of think he did the right thing. Just kind of sit there. And I've said it before on the show, and it, it's mainly, it's my opinion, but it is from... I formed the opinion from eyewitness testimony, and I think 99% of the time, if you, you know, if you just sit there and you don't freak out, and if you get up and slowly walk away, I think 99% of the time they'll leave you alone. Um, I, they're just not going to mess with you. It, it's weird. You know, I, I think I would have probably handled it differently. I think I probably would have freaked out, and then things would have went south. Um, but, you know, you didn't. Well, I'm very glad that it didn't. And I, you know, I, I don't think it was a female because <clears throat> the chest seemed flat. And, you know, I didn't see anything. And I would have, I think I would have seen that. Yeah, it could have been. Definitely could have been. You know, what really fascinates me is the dog's reaction. And you hear this a lot in people's encounters. But I grew up with a, uh, a Border Collie. And you're 100% right. I mean, they bark at everything. Uh, they're they're bred to be watchdogs. It's in their DNA. And, you know, the fact that the dogs wouldn't react or do anything, it's strange. You hear that time and time again. Uh, you know, even your chihuahua. Chihuahuas bark at everything, even their own shadows. Yeah, she was a barker, too. But it was almost like she disappeared. Like, I didn't hear a thing out of her. I mean, it was like she wasn't even there. Of course, I was so freaked out, I kind of forgot I had a dog. <laughs> I was just trying to maintain. That. I, I can't tell you how terrifying that was in that being like that. It, when you're out there like that and, and you have nowhere you can go, you know, it, it, that was that was what made it tough. Plus, it was so it was pretty close. Yeah, really close. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not so sure I would have handled it as well as you did. I would like to think I wouldn't freak out, but I think I probably would. Can I ask you, uh, why not tell your husband about what what you saw that day? I wondered about that, too. I'd never told him until 2017. I I think it's because it was such a departure from reality to me that I didn't want to 
go back there. I wasn't afraid of being laughed at or anything like that because I've had a lot of strange experiences in my life. But I think it was just be able to go go there and say that that was that thing exists to to do that. I mean, that's that's an, it's intense to say that really exists, you know. Yeah, and I understand what you mean. I mean, it's so far outside of uh, our reality. It does kind of, I mean, it shell shocks you. I get completely what you mean. When your husband saw the eye shine, how far away from camp was that? Um, you know, it's funny. I just asked him right before you called to have him see if he'd remembered, and he said it identical. I did say that. But um, he uh, was probably, oh, gosh, not we not far, like 30 yards it, we, there's a lot of deadfall right around us. There's nobody else at this place. It's it's a place we'd always go for complete isolation. There's a little ridge that that where we would camp. There's this little ridge, and and he said it was crouched, like it was something crouched. And now I've you know since then heard that they they crouched down like that. The thing that he kept talking over and over again was the size of the eyes and how far apart they were. And we both are outdoor people. We know of nothing that has that size of eyes, you know, and that size of a spread between the eyes. Yeah, and then to have it pace you out, I mean, it's very unnerving. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to come back to this encounter because I have a bunch of questions I want to ask you and kind of pick your brain and, and get your opinion on a few things. Uh, before we do that, Prior to having this encounter, what was kind of your thoughts on uh, if, you know, Bigfoot was real or not? Well, this is the part that's kind of surprising is when I was 18, I was up in Deer Park in the Olympic Mountains with a friend and we were screamed out. There was eight other people. And we were screamed out for about 20 minutes, but we didn't know what it was. And yet it sounded inhuman, but human at the same time, you know, just all these things on, like didn't make any sense. There was hunters with us and they were saying that's not an elk, it's not a mountain lion. And it was terrifying. And yet I shelved it in the back of my mind. I just shelved it. So it brought that back. Yeah, I think, you know, I've had a lot of eyewitnesses on the show, and uh, one comment they'll make a lot is, I don't really want to say Bigfoot. It it just, you know, it has that stigma to it, uh, but I'm really not sure what else it could be. Or the other comment uh, a lot of hunters will make after an encounter, uh, kind of like what you just did, Diane, they'll look back and go, oh, I wonder if that's what that was, you know, when something that happened to them prior to uh, seeing the creature um, tell me about, I know you, you're in Utah, and um, you had another sighting of the creature almost 17, 18 years later. Uh, if you would, tell me about that. Well, for some reason, the year 2017 is where all, I really just said, okay, that's it. You know, I'm, I, I'm going to accept this is real. And that's, well, I, had, I found your podcast, and I found uh, Rio, the guy who here in Utah, and we've become very good friends. And then I, I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're right here. And I, it's like, wake up, Diane. And I start looking around going, well, of course they'd be here. They got everything they, they ever could want. You know, complete privacy where we live. It's on the edge of wilderness. And so there's an area that um, I guess I'll just say it. Everyone knows about it. It's the North Ogden Divide. And I was um, going to, I went to martial art class like three times a week and I would it was at in the evening and it was an early evening and it was one of those perfect roadside uh sightings <laughs> I'm it we had that year about 10 feet of snow the it was February of 2017 and I always was looking I oh ever since I just once I woke up to this I'm always looking on the sides of the road and out in the woods as I'm driving and so there's this lone pine tree that's about 40 feet tall. And there was one standing next to it. And I could not wrap my brain around what I was looking at, but I knew exactly what I was looking at. It's just still that when it's outside of our little reality box, you know, it's like I'm sitting here in my car looking at a Sasquatch. Are you kidding me? And, and it was, it was amazing. It looked like a, a person. 
but he it looked like he had a hoodie on because he had the pointed head. I don't know if it was a he. I assumed it, but I guess when it's something big and massive, you you think masculine. But and and um, I have a friend who hikes, and he checked out the height next to that tree, and he got twelve feet. That that had to have been how big it was. Oh, I got you. So it didn't cross the road. You were driving. You drove past it. Is that what you're saying? I was, yeah, I was driving, heading west. And so it's to the south, on the south side of the road. And it was about, we've we've gone back and researched, uh, it's about 300 yards. So it's not close, but it's not that far either. The lighting was very good. It wasn't bright sunlight. It was, you know, when it's going to, when the sun dips behind a mountain, it's like bright, but not, you know, it's more, it's good lighting. And, And it only was about... 1001, 1002, probably 1003. And I, and then I thought I better look behind to see if anyone's coming. And then I look back and it's gone. And I know that they can read. I don't care how far they, they come inside your mind. That's my feeling. And he knew that I was looking at him or her. And then I looked away because then it was probably dropped to the ground or something it was there is a lot of snow there so it'd be easy to do that yeah and i know at 300 yards it's more of an outline and the great thing about that area is there's not a lot of trees in your way um and the fact that you were able to pick it out you know pick pick out this thing standing there um you know you made the comment and i want to talk about this and and get your opinion and have a real conversation about this because no one ever really has a real conversation about uh, the the weird stuff that really goes on with um, Sasquatch, and you'd mentioned the um, you know you felt like it was in your head, and at the beginning of the show I played the clip of uh, when I interviewed Les Stroud, and he had a very similar uh, experience. But if we could, can we go back to that first encounter? And you said it, you felt like it was in your head. Can you kind of define that for me? W- what does that mean? It felt like and it was uninvited that it just came inside my mind space and it was checking me out. And I felt like I didn't have any control over that. It's amazing feeling it. It's, it's like, you're like talking to someone inside your head, but it's not words. And it, yeah. And you're sharing consciousness with each other. And And that's the best way to put it. I have learned so much about myself and this world and reality since I've gone out and sit in these woods and, and be near where they I know they are. So. Yeah. I've had this explained three different ways to me. Um, one of the ways is people will hear a voice, but it's not their own. Um, and you'll hear it from people who, you know, have never heard voices before in their head, uh, very uh, sane people. And then, you know, this weird incident happens. Uh, People will also describe it as thoughts or ideas that really aren't their own. And then the the last thing is basically what you just said. So during this whole thing, you never heard it talking. There was nothing like that. It was just what I, it was a sharing of beingness and consciousness. And it was probably checking out, watching maybe through my eyes, the beadwork I was doing. I could feel it admiring what I was doing that that's something I recall. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing it. You know, I, I know you're nervous coming on and um, yeah, it's hard enough to come forward and say, I saw a big foot, but it's even harder to come forward and, you know, have something we, even more strange happen during an encounter. But I can tell you eyewitnesses are very consistent uh, when this sort of thing goes on. Uh, can I ask you something, and I, and I mean this in a very respectful way, so don't think I'm beating up on you on any of my questions or anything like that, but um, this does get reported with um, another entity, and it does get reported a lot, uh, specifically in demonic encounters. Uh, even people right before they get possessed will talk about it was uninvited, and it, it just kind of came in, and uh, I know yours was more of a happy encounter, but... Uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that there's no other animal on the planet that does this? Humans don't do this, but it is reported that uh, demons do this. And that's a very real world. Uh, if people haven't experienced it, um, it's absolutely real. 
But what are your thoughts on the fact that this gets reported a lot in demonic encounters? I'm very familiar with the demonic possession. I'm a what I call a spiritual counselor, and I do. Um, I used to do uh, work with that kind of stuff, and. I would just say my comment to that is there's so much about consciousness and reality that a lot of people don't understand because they're so tunnel visioned in, in the physical part of life. And so, yeah, I, demons, absolutely. They can get right in there too. But, you know, I, I mean, I was looking at this creature standing there, you know, it wasn't like there's some black cloud that floated up in front of me or something. And I'm referring to the thing in the woods because, <laughs> you know, it was like that. And I've never, you know, had an experience where some awful entity has tried to get in my head. And this didn't feel um, malevolent. It was not a bad thing at all. It was a feeling of just curiosity, the best way to put it, you know. Yeah, what I'd like to do is is put feelings aside for a second and talk about the mechanics and the the semantics behind it. And when you talk about demonic encounters or uh, even sometimes in alien encounters, they they it's the same thing. It's the same process. Um, you know, and again, put feelings aside. It's the exact same process. The same things happening. It's a very good observation, and I've never connected that together. But you're right. You're somewhat like a, a mouse in the hand of an eagle. You know, you're they they have the power is what I get. And, you know, it's like, but it's not bad. I've never, you know, but then again, who knows? I mean, I've been near a dog man and I won't go into that right now. But and that was that I could call demonic demonic. That was bad. But this is like it felt like, you know, like they have abilities that that we just haven't evolved and they know how to do that i know that they must um have like a what i call that hive mentality where they uh communicate with each other since they don't have cell phones they, i know they do i mean yeah i mean i could go into the whole mind speak thing but i don't want to sound like i'm off my rocker I, i'm kind of somewhat guarded about that but the more you spend time out there and I less Stroud, I, man, I know he, yeah, I, you can hear when somebody has had authentic, you know, they're out there and they, and they're humble and you're, you're open to getting into their world. And, and that's where you start to really learn things about them. I'm not out there. You know, I see a lot of these researchers. It's like a big joy ride to them, or they're just getting off on, you know, the thrill you know, it's it's a humbling experience being out there with that. It really is. Yeah, and I, I don't think you're crazy, Diane. I really don't. I've heard this off the air way more than I've actually put on the air. It does go on, and people are very consistent. You know, if you were the only one to tell me this, I'd be like, oh, I think she's a schizophrenic. But the fact is that it, it, people are reporting this, and they're very, very consistent on what they're telling you. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, I've had hunters who are, you know, country boys, and they've never had anything like this happen before. And then they run into this creature, and there's this weird thing happens. And there is weird stuff that goes on with Sasquatch. The Bigfoot community can look the other way all they want. This is absolutely going on. What's going on here, I don't know. It's kind of like the balls of light. You know, the whole Bigfoot community said, uh, I was a fool for talking about the balls of light, and I was uh, I was ruining the uh, the genre of Sasquatch, and on and on and on and on. Well, come to find out, most of them have actually seen the balls of light. They just don't talk about it because they're they somewhere in their tiny minds they think that uh, science won't take them serious. And I hate to break it to them at this point, but science doesn't take you serious now. Uh, might as well delve into some of this stuff and find out what's going on here. Most encounters, people talk about running into an animal. Yes, it has some human-like features, but it acts like an animal. It runs deer down. And then you hear about this other side of it, and it's like it, it's consistent when it's reported, but it's not consistently reported. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. And I think just like people, there's all levels of consciousness, maybe. I mean, this is we don't know anything really, but... 
there might be Sasquatch that are, are more peaceful. Maybe they're more evolved. I would never go down to Texas and go running off in those woods. I can sense that they're more animalistic. That's a feeling I get. But here they seem like they're not like that yet again they're going to rip apart a deer for dinner you know and and i've heard what uh, several screams up here um and they it's it's so terrifying when you first hear it i mean it 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 does sound demonic it's the only way but then you know we put labels on things and i i want to get past that you know i want to know more so you know I'm, i want to try not to limit myself by saying it sounds this way or that's what it is you know yeah, I understand where you're coming from, and and I I really do appreciate your feedback on this. Normally, when uh, I, I have these conversations with people, they get mad, and I, I think they think I'm uh, tearing them apart, and I'm really not. I'm 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 fascinated by it, and I would like to know more. But you know, labels do help you sometimes. It's kind of like the reason why I don't play with the Ouija board. Um, I know what's on the other side of that Ouija board. You'll never see me play with one, and I can put a label on that. For the audience, I want them to understand that I'm not saying Bigfoot's demonic, but it is important to kind of look into other genres and go, oh, that's weird. That happens over here. And not every demonic encounter starts off bad. Most of the time, they don't start off bad. Um, they end up that way. Well, let me ask you this before we get too much more into it, because it'll kind of help me what questions to ask you. What do you think Sasquatch is? <laughs> I know you ask everybody that. It, it's like my opinion has changed drastically since I first actively started going out there in 2017. And the thing that I, I feel now, it's like, you know how it is, the more you know, the more humble and the more you feel, the less you know of about it. And it's like they, like I said, they have this big, he, besides being big, they have a giant presence. And I've realized that, yeah, they have like a collective consciousness or mind. And I, I think we all do too, but there's, they know how to keep it away from us. You know, like you can't just go out there and, oh yeah, I'm going to talk to you now. It's like, they, it's more on their terms. But anyway, what they are, like I used to think it was Nephilim. I used to think it was a lost, you know, branch of human and now i i almost i really i feel like i'm still working on that answer <laughs> to be honest it's like i i don't i don't know there's so much about this world that that's right under our noses that that we don't even know is there yeah you and me are a lot alike diane i mean uh, i'm kind of the same way you know it's like you you think you haven't figured it out and the longer you're in this subject, the more you realize you really know nothing. Uh, and, it, and it's very, very frustrating. Um, and, and I love that, you know, with the whole situation with the mind speak and the glowing eyes and all that other stuff, I know I, I kind of have a, a cautionary uh, opinion of it. And I know you hold a different opinion. And, and I love that, you know, because if we agree on everything, then we really have nothing to talk about. Um, and I love the open dialogue and, and discussing this. L let me run this past you. This is my mindset on the whole thing. Uh, because we don't know what Sasquatch is, no one can answer that question. Does that concern you at all? You know, communicating in this fashion or, or having this sort of thing happen to you when you really don't know what it is? Yeah, I've always been a daredevil. My parents thought I would, you know, like people think I go on crazy vacations. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go in the jungles, you know, for my vacation <laughs> in Mexico or something like that. And it's like, yeah, I, we really, it's there. I feel like it's risky. And there's times where I, it's like, okay, it's time to leave, you know, and I won't push it. If I feel like something's not right, I'll leave. And, and, you know, it's being respectful. It's like bears. I mean, I've been around grizzlies a lot. And it's like you can get up to a certain level with them and then you've got to back off. You know, it's, you don't anthropomorphize anything that like, you know, these creatures, right? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a good point. Uh, tell me about the dogman that you ran into. Oh, gosh. So 
like I said, I'm one of those crazy people that runs off and does stuff that and it's like, okay. So I went to a little conference in Nashville that same in 2017. I went um, and I decided to rent a car for five days and go up to land between the lakes, lakes because I heard those Southern guys, Kumbo or but whatever those guys they were on at the time on podcasts and they were, they were telling how some family got ripped apart up there and in the northern part of the trace. And so what do I do? I go and rent a hotel room that's right next to the, it's called a trace, the road that goes up north and south. So I um, get there and I decided, and this was around the first, 4th of April. So there wasn't much going on and there wasn't many people. And I um, went in the car at dusk and drove up and there was, I'm driving north and I'm going on this road. I don't know where I'm at. I just took one of the little roads. There's all kinds of dirt roads in there. And I remember that one of those guys said, you don't want to go on the north, especially at night. Well, that's me. I go, what do I do? I go on there at night. That's me. And so I start getting this feeling of evil and this horrible feeling of dread and doom and that like almost like the world has come to an end and you might as well just go jump off a cliff because and it was like you're in the realm of death it was just horrible it was it, it and i and i'm like pushing myself to keep driving and i'm like no i gotta turn around and and so i it's not easy to turn around because it's such tiny roads you know and so you have to stop and you have to sort of back and fill to turn around and what do you know it and I had the windows half down <laughs> and there's another the same stench that smell came and filled the windows and I started getting pebbles thrown on the car and I I, I got out of there and went back to my hotel room I had more that happened on that trip in the morning but I'll just that's the one part about it. and so I had talked to some people and they said that dog man a lot of times that's the feeling they you get before when they're around and that's that's all i know but i i didn't see anything that night that night i had a tree pushed towards me the next morning but i didn't have that same doom or dread feeling when in the next morning you are a daredevil going up there by yourself <laughs> uh you're definitely more brave than i am um, you know that, so you didn't actually see the creature, but you know everything you're describing there from the smell to the pebbles to a tree being pushed over, um, a lot of that gets reported, the sense of dread, um, most of that gets reported with Sasquatch as well. I mean, it's not just a dogman thing. Huh. Well, I just, I've never, you know, I don't, I don't remember a lot of this, you know, I haven't heard a whole lot of dogman stuff, but I've just... I it was those southern guys. I think they mentioned something at when I heard it, you know, after I had been there. But I all I know is it consumed me. It was almost to the point where you would just drive off the side of the road and just stop living. It was that bad. It, it was really, really intense. And I had to bootstrap myself out of there. And, you know, it was it was almost like you know, when you hear the stories of infrasound, you know, and I've had that happen, but it's way different than that. This was way worse, the this feeling. And so, you know, you talk about the demonic thing. That's why I would never want to get involved with that kind of stuff. Oh, you know, it's dangerous. Yeah, I think anytime your gut's telling you something isn't right, it's time to go. And I really think you made the best decision there. And who knows, it could have been a dog, man. Uh, but it, I'm telling you, it does get reported a lot with Sasquatch. There, there's a lot of crossovers between Dogman and Sasquatch. Um, like, can I ask you something? You mentioned you were a spiritual counselor. Uh, define that for me. I, I don't know what that means. Is that like a priest? So instead of doing textbook therapy, I address the person on a like your spiritual level. I don't know if you're going to put this on the show or not, but yeah, I mean, I can take it out if you're not comfortable with it. I've, I have no issues with that. It, it really is a sincere question. Oh, it's okay. All right. So 
people are spiritual beings and there's a level of your body that's called the etheric body. It's like the overlay of you. It's between what you are as a spirit and then you as a physical being. And so I can see auras and I can see energy around people. And so when I, I help people get to the bottom of what's going on with them and negative patterns and things that are sabotaging their life, by looking at the patterns uh, in their auric field, and I can see, you know, what's going on. I have this theory that I've had really good luck finding Bigfoot, or I seem to know, I almost feel like I'm invited where to go, because I know where to go, and I find, I have hundreds of pictures of structures, because I, I don't live in that realm all the time of just the physical. I, you know, I go into that a higher, like a, I don't know how to describe it, but a state of consciousness where you're more connected to other things than just yourself or just in a problem solving mode. So, yeah, so that in the counseling, it's just, it helps people get to the bottom of what's going on in five minutes instead of five years or whatever. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it sounds fascinating. I'm not really into uh, religion, but I guess it would be like the same theory as mind, body, and spirit, uh, you know, as far as what the Bible says. So I, I kind of get where you're coming from on it. And and I do think there's more to us than uh, what we appear as, you know, in our physical appearance. I think, uh, you know, that's my own personal opinion. But, um, yeah, I appreciate you explaining it. I, I, it really was a sincere question. Um, while doing that, have you ever had um, an incident like a demonic encounter or a possession that you had to deal with? Yeah, the exorcism thing. I I started kind of getting involved with that. I where I live, there's you know it's all Mormon land. And I don't want to offend anybody. And most all my friends are Mormons. We have some great Sasquatch people that are they're all Mormons, but. There's some strange cults around here. And anyway, that so some of these people have come to me, you know, they're, that are plagued by this. But I kind of steered away from it because I felt like it's something that might stick around your house. Like, I don't want to go that direction. So I've had people growl and the room. Now, here's a great example. I've smelled smells from some of these people, but it never was as strong as that smell that I smelled in the woods. So maybe it's it, it's something different, I don't know. There's more sulfur in the smell that come from the people that are possessed. They know everything about you, these de demons, and they'll try and tear you down when you're trying to help that person. And you just have to ignore them and stay in your, you know, totally in your strength and your intention of what you're doing, and you have to just ignore what they say. Yeah, I'm fascinated by it. I really am, and um, I don't blame you, Diane. I, I probably would quit doing it, too, for the same thing you just said. You know, you don't want someone coming home with you. Um, so you've actually had a uh, demon speak to you through people. What did they say to you? They tear you down. They, they, they say things to you that they know like you have weak areas, like let's say I feel really bad about my weight. And so they'll say something so derogatory about you that they, that they, that can really hurt, you know, like, or you have, let's say you feel super guilty about something you did. They know, like say when you're a little kid, they'll just go right to it and get on you about that in a way that really it hurt. It's like, like I say, it can hurt you and it can like weaken you or open you up to where you're not in your power. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate going into it, Diane. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. And, um, but I, I try and keep it at arm's length. And I do watch some stuff on YouTube. And um, I, I really am fascinated by the whole thing. I'm sure the audience has checked out by now. They're like, oh, what's talking about demons? Um, but you know, I, I think that you sometimes have to look, I would love to have a ghost investigator, an alien investigator and a Sasquatch investigator all sit down and compare notes. There's kind of a weird thing in the Bigfoot world to where if someone doesn't agree with your opinion, uh, you know, they'll sit and attack you all day long. And 
Uh, it, it has nothing to do with beliefs. It has everything to do with ego as far as being unwilling to sit down and hear someone out and hear under, and try and understand where they're coming from. And um, I really enjoyed chatting with you, Diane. I, I would love to, uh, I know we could probably talk for the next two or three hours, uh, but I won't bore the, bore the audience with uh, my selfish fascination with, you know, this other stuff that goes on. Um, I enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it was nice talking with you too, Wes. Thanks again, Diane. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. <laughs>